if you can imagine what it might be like to have lost the ability to use your hands, the feeling of being able to restore your will or your um, volition to control a mouse or a cursor on a screen and then have that happen is a very powerful feeling. And we've lived that journey with Rodney. We're learning a lot from him. Rodney is an incredible person. He suffers from ALS. He's not able to use his hands and he's not able to talk. And Rodney has been a huge ball of energy in terms of working with us in trying to understand how to convert attempted control signals out of the brain to the computer system. And we think there's 100 million people in the world whose hands are not able to normally use a touchscreen. And there's about 5 million people who have severe motor impairment and their conditions such as stroke, uh, spinal cord injury, ALS or motor neuron disease, multiple sclerosis, and even severe arthropathies where the joints aren't working properly, um, stop people being able to use touchscreens. We've become, as a species, pretty dependent on touchscreens. So we're building technology for people who have lost the ability to control the computer whatsoever and they're dependent on other people. So as we think about clinical trials, it's can we return critical daily tasks that mean that you can function independently. So we're focusing on how to deliver applications like communication, texting, emailing, um, environmental control, shopping, banking. These are the things that uh, we take for granted that are really critical to living independent lives and we're trying to focus on restoring them for patients with severe injury and disease due to paralysis. As brain-computer interfaces started to emerge, it became obvious that open brain surgery comes with a you know, range of challenges. So the idea was to build a solution that avoided open brain surgery. The brain-computer interface that we're building is inserted into the brain through a blood vessel. Uh, so it's a minimally invasive procedure that's performed in the cath lab, the same place where you might have a stent put in. There are four components to our system. Uh, it's fully implanted, so it's invisible. If you were looking at someone who had one implanted, you wouldn't know that it was there. We come into the jugular vein in the neck and the stentrode goes up through the jugular vein into a blood vessel that sits right on top of the motor cortex, which is the area of the brain that controls all the movements in your body. That wire exits the blood vessel in the neck, in the jugular vein, and then connects to the second part of the system, which is a implanted receiver transmitter unit, IRT. That is, sits under the chest, under the skin, in the subcutaneous tissue. Um, in the same place, you might see a pacemaker for a cardiac implant. And then that communicates wirelessly to an outside device that's about the size of an iPhone, which receives the data from the brain does the conversion of the brain data into a control signal, which creates control of connected devices that are local. We've only had three hospitals so far involved in the feasibility trial. And as we move into the pivotal stage, we're going to be expanding to about 20 or 30 sites. And we will soon be opening a patient registry for any patients that are interested in um, applying. We'd love to hear from anyone who's got any interest. We'll hopefully be offering the technology to a much larger number of people shortly. I think there's a very bright future with a lot of new products and different diseases that can be treated using the blood vessels as the entry point into the brain that we are um, building in the background and hopefully going to be announcing in the future.